Good evening. I hereby call the January 18th, 2022 school committee meeting to order, being the time is 7.03. Please join me in saluting the flag. Thank you very much. I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, Mayor Sullivan is unable to attend this evening. He is at a conference in Washington. So I will be um, vice chair in the meeting this evening. So see, we need to establish a quorum. I'd like to take a roll call vote. And uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, Ms. Ehlers, Mrs. Ehlers? Here. Mr. Homer? Here. Mrs. Mendez? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan? Here. Ms. Uh, mic on, please. Mr. Sullivan? Here. And I'm Joyce Azak. I'm present. So we've established a quorum. We will now go into the agenda. Item number two on the agenda is hearing of visitors, and I was notified we do not have any hearing of vis visitors this evening. Correct, Melinda? Thank you. Let's see, we're going to move on to item number three is the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, I'm just going to read the three items on the consent agenda. We have approval of January 4th, 2022 school committee meeting minutes. Uh, item number B is acceptance of notification of personnel appointments, certified personnel. Item number, uh, letter C is accepted, acceptance of notification of personnel actions, leaves of absence, resignations, and retirements. Do we have any questions? Anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda at the moment? Motion to accept consent agenda. Mrs. Sullivan has uh, made a motion to accept. Do I have a second? Second. Mrs. Ehlers has seconded that motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Thank you. It passes. So just for the minutes, uh, I already read items A, B, and C. Let's see what we have here. Item number four, we have reported the superintendent of schools, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Ms. Azak. First, we're going to welcome, um, he's zooming in, is Dr. Herman, uh, is going to give us an update on, um, on COVID. We always, always welcome his, um, his presentations. Um, obviously, he's the pandemic consultant uh, for the city and has been now for the last uh, several months, almost two years. So. He joins us pretty much um, every other month, and he's going to give us an update on um, where we are with um, the variant, the Omicron variant, and how the numbers look in our city. So is he with us, Melinda, Dr. Herman? Superintendent, I can hear you. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes. OK. Uh, yeah, it's a, the audio is a little bit tough, so if uh, you're having a problem hearing me, just let me know. So uh, thanks once again for uh, welcoming me back. Uh, I'm not quite sure why you welcome me back. The news is never good. But uh, we'll go ahead and share the statistics on what's been going on in Brockton. Quite a lot uh, has changed since, uh, since uh, last time I was here. So uh, this is day number 676 of the pandemic that had the first case in Brockton on March 14th of 2020. Uh, last time I was here, uh, which was on uh, Pearl Harbor Day, how appropriate things really did kind of uh, enter disaster mode uh, after that. This was the graph that I showed you, and it looked like at the beginning of December uh, cases were going up. Well, uh, if I were smart, I would have really changed the graph to make it look like this in anticipation of what was coming, because it seems like every day I'm changing the uh, the parameters on the graph to accommodate because really what things look like now are more like this. Uh, the blue arrow is when I was here uh, last time on December 7th and this is where we are now. On uh, January 3rd uh, we had a high of 782 
case cases from that day specimens obtained on january 3rd after the long holiday weekend you can see where it looks like there was a drastic uptick and there's also a drastic downtick i'm not sure that that's real because that represents the last three days and there's been very little testing done in brockton in the last three days on saturday uh, because of the weather uh, testing sites, some testing sites were closed Sunday, testing sites were closed, and on Monday, because of the holiday, some testing sites were closed. So not a lot of specimens were actually obtained over those last three days. So it really is going to uh, be over the next couple of days that we get a much better idea of what the pattern looks like. In addition, there's been so many tests that are positive and so many tests that are done <laughs> that there is a really significant delay, kind of like at the beginning of the pandemic where it takes days and days and days. Today, uh, there were probably about 16 cases from five days ago. Uh, five days ago, that's already at the end of your period of isolation. So you get called and you say your test is positive from five days ago. Well, you're ready to end your isolation now. So it doesn't do much good if the test is taking that long. This was another graph I showed you. This is the CDC metric. They measure, uh, they total up the previous seven days uh, and then average it for, for 100,000 population, and anything over 100 is bad. Uh, and this is where we were kind of going up at the beginning of December. And once again, if I was smart, I would have made it look like this uh, in anticipation of what was coming, which is really this. So this is where we are today. Again, the numbers went skyrocketing. As I said, anything over 100 is considered high community transmission. We were up over 3,000. So really in the stratosphere. Uh, in terms of cases in Brockton. And once again, you see the numbers falling off again. And uh, I'm just asking to be patient and really see what the next week shows to really determine how quickly things fall off. Uh, it is true that the Omicron variant in other regions has gone up very quickly and has come down very quickly. So I'm hoping that that is the case in uh, Brockton. These are the uh, people in Brockton who are actively uh, have, uh, in isolation right now. So still contagious, in isolation, tested positive. We were up, uh, uh, peaked at uh, over 4,000 cases and, uh, and today uh, just over, uh, uh, just about 2,500 cases. Uh, the bad news is really uh, happening in the hospitals. So in the two hospitals in Brockton right now, they are really struggling, struggling both because they have a lot of COVID patients. Uh, and as I've said in the past, anything over 15% of the hospital beds being occupied by COVID patients is really considered critical. They're really up closer to 40% of, their, of the hospital beds being occupied by COVID patients right now. And in addition, they're struggling because of staffing. Staff are out sick. Uh, and it's really uh, just hard to to the basic functionings of a hospital. And this is our safety net. We want there to be hospital beds available. We want to be able to take care of the sickest of the sick. And so this is really where my focus is in, in terms of uh, really monitoring how, how uh, severe the pandemic is in Brockton. This is the death toll from the beginning of the pandemic, number of deaths per month. And I'd just like to point out that uh, in the month of December, the death toll really did go up significantly. But uh, if there's any silver lining, it's to know that in, in December, uh, when you compare it to December of, of last year, there were more than double the number of cases in December of 21 than there were in December of 20. And yet the death toll uh, was percentage of folks that uh, got severely ill was a lot less. Uh, we'll see what happens in January, but already 14 deaths so far through half of the month. Uh, and this is a profile of the victims of COVID in the city of Brockton, so by age group. So you can see it still remains uh, uh, a, a very serious illness for an older population, not so much for those in the school age group. Uh, this is what our test positivity rate is doing. This is another metric that we monitor. We want it to be under 4%. Uh, way back at the beginning of the pandemic, we were hitting close to 50%. And that's because the tests were very, very limited. We didn't have that many of them. They were new. Uh, they uh, really, the only people that got tested were the people with, with symptoms. And so it would be expected that they were going to be positive. 
But now we've kind of leveled off, and over the past week, well, we hit 20%. And just looking at the, the numbers in, the, in, the, in, the, in Brockton uh, last week, for example, about 35% of the uh, tests from Brockton residents who went to the testing sites in Brockton were positive. At Neighborhood Health Center, that number was over 50%. So I have a feeling when this uh, number comes out on Thursday, it's going to be up closer to 30% of positive tests rather than 20% of positive tests. This is tonight's dashboard put together a couple hours ago. Uh, and just to uh, point out, we are really over 27,000 cases. It seems like we just hit 25,000 a few days ago. Uh, again, the red, yellow, green number that we like to see under 10 is now up to 361. Unbelievable. I don't think I ever could have predicted that. It's really an astounding place to be. Uh, and uh, the uh, number of folks in the hospital as of today, 140 COVID positive patients between the two hospitals. We are not alone. Uh, I think, you know, I could draw up the towns surrounding Brockton uh, in Massachusetts and uh, the, the rest of the country, you know, our red, yellow, green number, these, this is it for all the towns really up in the 200s, 300s. Uh, and, and these numbers, I, I must say, this was through January 8th, which is the most recent numbers that the state can provide. Uh, and so the numbers are changing so rapidly. I'm sure they're uh, a lot different uh, today if we could measure them today than they were uh, on January 8th. But that number has gone up from, you can see the low in the teens, uh, all up, uh, up over 300 cases per day per 100,000 population, really rising quite rapidly. Uh, I have compared us with uh, like communities, so the gateway cities in southeastern Massachusetts. Again, these numbers change so quickly that uh, the, the number that you come up with on January 8th probably is not that close to the number you would come up with on January 18th. But test positivity rates up in the 20% all over the place. Average daily cases skyrocketing all over the place. Uh, what about contact tracing? So for those of you who have um, I followed these reports on the committee, you know that I, I like to kind of show where uh, where the contact tracing is in the city, where are the clusters, where are the workplaces, where are the homes. Uh, uh, but but it, now it's different. Uh, contact tracing has essentially come to a standstill. Uh, the the number of cases has overwhelmed the ability to do perform any significant contact tracing. Uh, in the city of Brockton, probably about 10 or 15 percent of the cases are formally traced at this point. The state has kind of given all the local boards of health the directive, prioritize your cases. And so the priorities are really for the K through 12, nursing homes, congregate care settings, really getting away from the day to day, everybody gets traced to focusing on selected uh, populations. And, uh, you know, just from the the school, the school's point of view, it's tough to do contact tracing when, you know, a dozen school nurses are out sick with COVID. It's tough to do contact tracing when, like today, 84 new positive cases were uh, reported from over the weekend. So it's uh, quite a challenge. I don't think it's a forever problem. I think that when the cases do come down, we'll be able to contact trace. But for right now, uh, there really is effectively no contact tracing. When uh, I spoke to you on December 7th, uh, Omicron was about 10 days old, uh, had just been uh, reported halfway around the world in South Africa uh, at the end of November. Uh, and the questions I asked, uh, I had no answers to. So let's now figure out what we have answers to. So is it more contagious? Yes, obviously it is far more contagious than the Delta variant or any previous variants. And you can tell that because uh, you all have either had COVID, have a family member with COVID, have a close friend with COVID, know someone with COVID, uh, you know, because it's everywhere right now because this uh, uh, variant is so contagious. Is it more severe? Probably not. Uh, it really tends to live up in the nose and throat uh, as opposed to traveling down into the lungs. So this is why the percentage of folks with Omicron variant uh, are not 
in the ICU are dying. But because of the overwhelming numbers of patients that there are, it does appear that there's a lot more hospitalizations uh, than uh, in past variants. Are vaccinated individuals protected? Well, it kind of depends on how many vaccines you've got. If you only have your primary series, your first and second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, probably not protected too well, probably only about 35% efficacy. If you've gotten your booster, uh, well, then you're probably up in the 75% uh, efficacy range. So you really do need the booster to have protection against the uh, Omicron variant. Are previously infected people protected? Well, everybody who's been infected has some element of immunity, but we know that the uh, infection does not give you the same level of immunity as a vaccine does. A vaccine gives you a far greater antibody level than the, uh, than the actual disease itself. And we are seeing cases of folks who had the Delta or some previous variant infection who are now getting Omicron infection. Can the PCR tests, that is the molecular tests and the antigen tests detect the Omicron variant? Yes, they can. Uh, the, uh, all of the, uh, all of the um, rapid antigen tests can detect uh, Omicron variant. The antigens on the surface of the virus uh, lend itself to being detected. However, we're just kind of learning about are these uh, at-home tests great by getting nasal samples, or do we have to rethink that and start to get throat samples? And that's something more that we're, we're learning about now. And do monoclonal antibodies work? Well, uh, the answer is yes and no. The monoclonal antibodies that we had in high volume uh, and were given by both hospitals in Brockton are completely ineffective at treating Omicron. They just don't work, and that's why the hospitals and uh, other regions stopped using those particular monoclonal antibodies. There is a third monoclonal antibody that is effective. It's just not uh, available in high quantities right now and will probably take a while before it does become available. Let's talk about kids. Uh, on the left-hand side is the start of the school year last year, remote, uh, and uh, kind of looked at the time span uh, from September up through this week in January, did the same thing on the right-hand side. But this is this September, or a few months ago, up until uh, yesterday. And this is just a percentage of the breakdown by cases. And you can see when things were remote, uh, far fewer kids were being infected as schools have opened up and it's become more interactive. And of course, COVID is uh, more prevalent, uh, a higher percentage of kids uh, overall uh, have gotten Omicron, uh, have gotten COVID. And you can see on the other end of the spectrum, uh, a l higher percentage in the elderly, a little bit less percentage in the elderly, probably related to the fact that they've been boosted uh, more so than the rest of the population. This is where we were six weeks ago uh, when last I spoke with you, almost 3,000 uh, cases, and uh, this is where we are today, nearly 5,500 total cases, uh, and you can see these are both confirmed cases, which is a molecular test, probable cases, which are the antigen tests. We're seeing a lot more of those. Uh, we did have an additional hospitalization of someone under the age of 18, and thankfully, no deaths. This may be the last time that uh, I'm going to be able to vouch for the accuracy of COVID uh, test data. And the reason I say that is because I believe that uh, home test kits are going to be finally uh, more rapidly available, uh, more accessible, and I'll talk about that in, in just a sec. But with the home test kits, we lose the ability to have accurate data because these uh, test kits are not reported into the state's epidemiologic network, not recorded. So we're not gonna know how many folks at home test positive. Uh, and so uh, the, the numbers will become less and less accurate as time goes on throughout the course of the uh, pandemic. This is what your profile in Brockton looks like, just in terms of the number of students in the various age groups uh, and the number of kids since the start of the pandemic uh, in those school age groups. So obviously grade school kids, uh, kindergarten before uh, middle school, uh, lots and lots of cases. 
this is what the number looks like by month. So you can see the you know, plurality of cases has really happened over the last two months. And I, and I guess if I were smart, I probably would have made this number go up to 3,000 because when I come back, if you'll have me again in six weeks, we'll probably see this January number be up closer to uh, 3,000 or 2,500 just because we're only halfway through the month and the tests keep coming in. Uh, it always surprises me how uh, evenly split this is. It's really right down the middle, 50-50 between uh, boys and girls. So just wanted to say a word about uh, vaccines. And when we're talking about kids, what we're really talking about is the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Uh, and I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because there's been a lot of uh, change recently in terms of isolation and quarantine and number of vaccines and what's a booster and what's a third dose and what's fully vaccinated. So this is where we are today. And I'm sure when we come back in six weeks, this will change. But right now, the language that we use to try and all be on the same page is we talk about the primary series. So uh, your first go around is either two shots of Pfizer or Moderna or a single dose of Johnson & Johnson. That's referred to you as your primary series. The CDC still uses the phrase fully vaccinated to indicate someone who's gotten their primary series and then two weeks later, so two weeks after that, they feel there's been an antibody response uh, after those first two doses or the single dose of j and and you're considered, quote, fully vaccinated. There's a lot of controversy amongst medical professionals, myself included, who feel that this is not an accurate term and really should not be used. Uh, because when you say fully vaccinated, it gives the impression that someone is fully vaccinated and they're not. They're not fully vaccinated against Omicron until they've gotten a booster. And so I don't think that this phrase should be used, but it is. And it has a lot of uh, implications. Uh, you know, when uh, the CDC talks about quarantining folks, it says if you've uh, if you're up to date, and we'll talk about that uh, on your vaccinations, meaning if you've gotten your booster, then you don't have to quarantine. Whereas DESE says if you're fully vaccinated, uh, then you don't have to quarantine. So there is you know, some implications of the language that's, uh, that's used. We've heard about a third dose or an additional primary dose. So this is really just for the few people who are severely immunocompromised organ transplant patients, people with immune, immunodeficiency diseases, they get their primary disease and then a month later get another dose. That's a third dose. That's what that's referred to. The booster dose is something that you give uh, sometime after your primary series to bump up your antibody level. And so with the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, that's now five months after your primary series is when you get your booster shot or two months after your Johnson & Johnson shot. And you're considered to be boosted immediately after you got the dose. You don't have to wait two weeks to be called boosted. As soon as you get your booster dose, you're called booster. So the CDC is now using this phrase up to date. <clears throat> and depending on your age group, if you've gotten all the recommended vaccines for your age group, including your booster, then you are considered to be up to date with your vaccinations. And just a refresher for kids, uh, under the age of five, uh, not eligible yet for any kind of vaccines. Uh, in the five to 11 year old range, uh, they can get a primary series with Pfizer, but not yet eligible for a booster. So they would be considered up to date after their primary series. And then in the 12 to 17 year old age group, they are eligible for the primary series with Pfizer, a booster with Pfizer five months later after their primary series. So they would be up to date after they've gotten their after they've gotten their booster. Uh, this is since school started, just taking a look, I'm looking at the 12 to 15 year olds uh, in, in this particular graph, just to show their vaccine status of the, the thousand plus kids who have tested positive since the start of school, uh, the vast majority unvaccinated or only got one dose of the mRNA. Uh, but 174 did get a uh, primary series. So it wasn't a whole lot of time for folks to get uh, boosted, seeing as though this was only approved in May. <laughs> so uh, you, you would have had and gotten your primary series in May, your second shot in June, wait five minutes, five months later, you know, and you couldn't even get boosted until December. That's if you hit the ground running and got your first 
shots in, in, in May. Uh, so only four uh, that have been uh, boosted. And, and of those four, by the way, three of them had gotten their booster probably about two weeks before they got sick. So I'm not sure that it really had a chance to be effective as a booster. <laughs> this is what the total population of Brockton, all comers, kids too, under the age of five, everybody. Uh, so this is what the profile of the city looks like. The grayed out area basically are unvaccinated. So either no shot at all unvaccinated or just one shot of the uh, mRNA series. The blue represents completing the primary series and the green is people that have gotten boosted. So really only 20% of the population has gotten a, a booster. And you can see by age group who those folks are who have gotten boosted, mainly <laughs> Uh, 65 and up, and still only half of that population has gotten a booster. And uh, I think that, you know, there are a lot of other efforts in the city, like twice weekly vaccination clinics at the Council on Aging, to really target this population who are at risk the most of dying from COVID. There are breakthrough infections. So this is a uh, breakthrough infection is still defined as someone fully vaccinated. So two doses, not booster doses, two doses uh, who has tested positive. So uh, of the 58,000 plus folks in Brockton who are so-called fully vaccinated, meaning got at least two shots, there have been over 3,000 te positive tests, breakthrough infections. Of those, a small quantity have been hospitalized and some have died. And so it's the vaccine clearly is not foolproof. It's, it works uh, somewhat. Uh, I think the strength of the vaccine is if you get the booster, it's quite likely that your illness will be less severe. It doesn't guarantee it will be, but it's quite likely it will be. So a lot of talk these days on testing. Uh, and so uh, the test sites in Brockton, as in every region in the country have been overwhelmed. Really the, uh, the one site that was open was at Massasoit drive through testing. Uh, probably about a little under half of the folks that go there are residents of the city of Brockton. Uh, to meet the demand, we were able to get a second testing site open, uh, which is outside of the Shaw Center. So there is now a second testing site. It does require pre-registration to make an appointment. Uh, to go there, but we now have two testing sites in uh, in Brockton. Uh, I'm going to defer talking about the school testing program um, only because, uh, you know, Linda Cahill is really the expert on this. And uh, as of today, uh, everything may change. Uh, so I'm not uh, an expert on this because the webinar is tomorrow. Uh, but uh, today, the um, uh, DESE did uh, say that there was going to be a new program starting for staff on the 24th of January and for students on the 31st of January uh, that will uh, provide students and staff, teachers and the like, uh, the opportunity to do one home test kit per week. Uh, and they will be distributing this out of the millions of cases, the, the, uh, test kits that the state has. So that's something that's going to be uh, discussed, to, uh, I imagine, uh, in the days to come. The uh, at-home test kits, I think, are going to play a bigger role uh, in COVID. Uh, they would play a bigger role if you could find one, but clearly when uh, everybody had COVID and no one could find a test kit, that's a problem. And uh, we're trying, again, to be proactive uh, in Brock, and I don't think this is a forever problem. I do think the test kits will be coming uh, in Brockton. Uh, We've got the advantage of having Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, which through a federal grant uh, has been able to secure, I think, about 130,000 uh, kits and a second order for another 130,000 kits. Those should be coming uh, with it. Hopefully, we don't have a, a date, but hopefully we're anticipating next week that we'll get them. Uh, uh, Two thirds of those will go to the city for distribution to various groups. Uh, and uh, in addition to those tests, the mayor's office has ordered uh, thousands and thousands of kits. Uh, we're working with the county to get us kits. So we're hoping that we will be having uh, at-home test kits available to many constituencies within the city in the coming days or weeks. And as you probably all know by now, uh, uh, why wait for 
the city to come through. Just go to covidtest.gov. Uh, this is uh, was supposed to be available tomorrow, but it uh, actually opened up for Brockton yesterday. Uh, so if you want a test kit uh, mailed directly to your home uh, for for tests per address anywhere in the United States, uh, just go to covidtest.gov right now and your name and address, and uh, it will be mailed to you. Uh, so everybody uh, who has a mailing address in the United States of America just has to enter that, and they can get their four test kits mailed to them. So there is a lot more to talk about, uh, and uh, this is just today's updates on the CDC site of things we could talk about, but I'm not going to because I've talked uh, long enough, and I know you have other things on your agenda. Uh, but I am uh, willing to take some questions as I become less and less less knowledgeable about all things COVID that are going on, but we'll be happy to tackle questions if you have them. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Um, any of the committee members have any questions? And I think you're gonna have to talk right into the mic for me to hear you, because. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Herman. Any of the members have any questions, comments? Mrs. Mendez. Hi, Dr. Herman. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that the, um, the two doses was about 35% protect, um, percentage to protect, and the booster was about, it came out to like 35, 40% as well. So if you have all three doses, you're protected about 70%. Is that what you said? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I couldn't quite get your question. The, um, was it about test test positivity? No, it was about the two the um, first doses oh, of oh, vaccination yes, versus yes, the yes. booster. Right. You said right. that. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So the effectiveness of the vaccine. So uh, if you get a primary series, for example, of Moderna or uh, Pfizer, uh, and you complete that primary series, your first two doses. Uh, although it was highly effective against the previous variants, the Delta variant and the like, uh, it's not so effective against um, the Omicron variant, which is now basically 100% circulating. That's what, that's what we're seeing now in, in Brockton. So I said it's probably about a 35% efficacy. It offers you some protection, uh, but not the kind of, not the level of protection that we'd like. So that, that's why getting the booster uh, is so important. Okay, so the booster technically is a 35% as well for this variant. Yeah, so, so the booster I, will get you up to about 75% efficacy. Those old days when the vaccines first came out and everybody was so excited because they were 95% effective, that's not the case anymore. Uh, they are, and that's, when I say effective, that's for preventing uh, disease, so for test, preventing you from turning positive. So about 75% effective and preventing you from turning positive. They might be far more effective that in preventing serious illness or death. So just because they're not up in the 90s doesn't mean that they're not working. They, they work on, you know, not only to protect you, prevent you from getting illness, but they also work to prevent you from getting serious illness or from dying. So, but, but, but you really do need that booster. That's the point. Get your booster is the point. All right, thank you. And then my last question is, there's an added test site that you said at the Shaw Center, but we have a total of about 106,000 people. Um, I myself went to the Massasoit test site and it was ridiculous. Um, is there any way that we can get more test sites and how can we advocate for that? I, I didn't quite hear. Can you repeat the question? Uh, so you mentioned we were just added with another test site because we just yes. had Massasoit. And now we have the Shaw Center that it's only by appointment. Is there yes. any way that we can get more test sites? And how do we advocate for that? Because we have a population about about 106,000 people in Brockton. But you also mentioned that Massasoit only half of the only half the people that go there are from Brockton because it's a regional site. So yes. how do we advocate yes. for more sites? Well. Uh we, we probably, we, we've advocated with the state, and that's how we got the additional Stop the Spread test site at the Shaw Center. It's not likely that they're going to be adding any more uh, test sites because we already have two uh, in Brockton. So uh, 
we're fortunate to have the two when you compare us to other areas. We are working internally to see if we can uh, explore other options uh, in other locations. And uh, nothing's definite yet, so I don't want to mention it yet. But we are um, working to see if we can find other sites as well. And also making a huge effort to try and procure uh, and distribute as many home tests as we can, because I feel at the end of the day that that may be uh, the go-to method for most folks is to be able to have a supply of home tests available and learn how to use them properly. Uh, you know, not just take a test every day, but to prioritize the kind of testing you do, which would be one, symptomatic testing. So if you've got symptoms, do a test. The second priority would be exposure testing. So you've been exposed to someone and learn when are you supposed to take that home test, not right away, but give it a few days uh, to make sure that it's going to be uh, positive. And then, uh, uh, you know, if tests become far more readily available, then we consider, you know, spot testing, which would be, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to visit my grandma. Uh, she, let me take a test in her driveway before I go in the front door. Uh, and then I guess the, the last priority would be to use it for, for surveillance monitoring. So I'm just going to, like, like we're going to be doing in the schools, uh, take a test uh, every week or twice a week or however, just to kind of make sure that you don't have asymptomatic uh, COVID. So I, I, I feel like if we can get our, our hands around getting uh, access to home test kits, uh, that, that may help take some of the pressure away from the uh, testing sites. Yeah, but the only concern I have about that is how do we, you mentioned how would we collect the data? Is there any way to collect the data that someone calls a number and gives like if they're positive or negative? Because without that data, I feel like that gets us, it's, it's not good. Yeah, and the, the home test kits uh, vary. Um, you know, it's not just one test kit, you know, I don't know if, you know, how many of you have had the opportunity to go through many of them. Some are quite simple, uh, take the swab, put a couple drops, see the red line, you know, you're positive. Uh, others, uh, you know, are linked with um, smartphone apps, uh, will actually read the test for you and report it to the state, uh, lots of bells and whistles, but, you know, those are the very expensive tests. and. Uh, you know, that would be, I think, prohibited to get hundreds of thousands of those tests. So it's going to be, a lot of it is going to morph into honor system, the school level, especially if you do adopt the program uh, for, um, for at-home testing. Uh, you know, you're going to be relying on somebody to perform the test accurately, interpret the test accurately, and then report the results back. Uh, so, you know, there's, there are a lot of levels to this, but I don't know much about this program other than to know that it has been used in other states like Connecticut and Vermont and has been used successfully, but everything is a new program uh, when you come to COVID. You know, nothing can be more than a year old uh, or two or two years old. So uh, we don't know for sure, but, uh, but I, I think uh, you're right that we will lose we will lose track when it comes to this antigen testing and the positive tests that are not going, that are not being reported into the state system. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mendez. Um, actually, before um, Mrs. Ellers, I just had a quick question, Dr. Harmon. Um, um, here you go, if you can hear me now. So yeah. Mrs. Mendez made some really great points um, that I was going to bring up is we're going to lose control of our numbers when we have a lot of at-home tests, where now we are getting the reporting from Massasoit and other, other um, locations. Now, as far as the Shaw Center location that's up and running, is it every day? Um, do you know the hours offhand, and, and how do they go about requesting an appointment? Is it an online appointment, or do they have to call and set up an appointment? Yes, uh, and so you can go to the state uh, testing site. Um, uh, I forgot, I, I should know it off the top of my head, but you can go to the state testing site. It's a little bit of a hoop to jump through because I think you do have to have either an email address or a cell phone to register for the uh, test. You, it's not walk up uh, and you do have to register. Uh, and uh, I think they ask you to put in a username and password. So you do have to jump through a hoop or two to, to schedule your uh, appointment. But it, it, it should be uh, on the, Department of Public Health uh, testing site and listed as one of the 
one of the locations. The same people that run Massasoit, uh, by the way, these are not city run per se. The, the, the state contracts with a private firm to run the uh, to run these test sites. The city provides support services uh, as needed. So at the Shaw's, for example, you know, the electricities and computers and any traffic uh, management, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, but the, the, the city is not the owner necessarily of these test sites. Okay, and one last question. So I know you posted the website or you mentioned the website um, to get the four tests. But I know I've gotten a few text messages, and I'm sure others have today, that the USPS, um, if you go on and you log on and you put your information in there, they're also giving you four free tests. Is this the same site that we're also giving everyone, or is it? No, no, no. The four, the four free tests, that website of uh, um, covidtests.gov, that's, uh, that's for every resident of the United States of America. So... Uh, the federal government says that they've got enough tests to distribute to every household in the country. Uh, and so uh, if you go to that covidtests.gov right now, uh, you can put in your name and address and they will mail you four test kits. They say seven to 10 days, but you know, it's a new program, we'll see what happens. It was supposed to be up and running tomorrow, uh, but for some reason they jumped the gun and it's active now. So that's totally different. The, 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 the Shaw site, of course, is, is a PCR test, nasal swab, send it off, uh, you know, wait a day or three or five these days to get the uh, test result back. Okay, one last question and then I'll go to Mrs. Ehlers. Um, I do, I, I am receiving a lot of calls from parents um, that are very concerned that, you know, the contact, who's a close contact and how we, how we, um, figuring out who's a close contact with students in the schools. So I, I had a couple of calls today from parents. So is so it something? I can jump in. Thank you. It's basically impossible to keep it up, and that's why Desi is coming up with this new program. It's, it's unmanageable. Um, nurses cannot keep, and their aides who are working with them cannot keep up with the contact tracing with the numbers this high. So Desi has come out with this new program that they would be testing, uh, sending us rapid tests every week. Um, uh, we already have purchased 20,000 on our own. Those are going out to schools probably this Friday. Those will be provided to students and staff who are symptomatic uh, or somebody if we can identify exactly who's a close contact and they could take those tests home. If you're symptomatic, you would obviously go home with the test and then we are gonna sign up there's a webinar tomorrow, like Dr. Herman said, that if you sign up for this um, rapid test, it would be weekly, uh, and it would eliminate the contact tracing um, because you'd be able to give tests out right away. But to, to make it simple, and I had several meetings with superintendents over the last, um, it's been very difficult to contact trace before the holidays. Now it's next to impossible to keep track of it. It's just, it's unmanageable. Um, you would need another 500 employees to do it. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's just impossible to keep track of. Um, people are doing their best, but that's why DESI is coming out with this new program. And luckily that we're already signed up for test and stay. This would replace the test and stay for students and staff. But ahead of this, we have 20, we've already audited 20,000 tests on our own. Uh, those will be coming in distributed to schools and those for students and staff to take, you know, again, for symptomatic, uh, if they're really a close contact and we know it, they would then take those home as well and be told when to take the test. But I'll have much more information with you. I emailed you out what the Department of Ed sent today for their notice that came out from them and the DPH and the governor's office. And then tomorrow, uh, Linda Cahill will uh, attend the, sem uh, the webinar and have much more information. And I'll send that to you tomorrow in an email as well. But Again, to make a long story short, it's almost impossible to contact Trace now. No, thank you. I just wanted clarification. I pretty much knew that that was going to be the answer. It's just our numbers are really high at this point. They're the highest they've ever been, and it's, it's difficult. All, all I can say is if, if you have symptoms, you don't feel well, or your child has symptoms and doesn't feel well or has been in contact with someone, it's just we got to communicate with other, other parents to try to keep our numbers down. 
because uh, I did have some, some parents reach out to me that were very concerned, and it's just we're doing the best that we can to try to keep our numbers down, but there's just so many that are positive that it's difficult because they were asking me questions about contact tracing, how do we figure this out, um, you know, lunches, things like that. It's and it's, just, an, it's also important to know it's, it's, it's not working. Even when you can contact trace, it's just not doing what it was supposed to do because it's just, it's not, it's actually not keeping the numbers down. It's just not working. The, the, uh, the rapid test that we'll be able to send home will work to really help stop the spread. Um, and I think that's a smart move by the state switch into that. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Ehlers. Dr. Herman, thank you so much for taking my question. With contact trace and basically being, you know, at a standstill and the fact that if you're boosted, you are 70% plus protected, is the CDC guidelines still outlined by the quote unquote fully vaccinated or are they now isolating based off of whether you're boosted or does it make a difference? So uh, isolation, uh, you know, just so that we're all on the same, everybody probably knows this by now, you know, isolation means you've tested positive, you have the disease. It doesn't matter if you test positive, it doesn't matter if you've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, boosted, up to date, whatever. If, if, you, if you test positive, you test positive and you have to isolate and you isolate for five days. If you are exposed to someone, uh, then you go into quarantine. So quarantine means you're, you don't know if you've got the disease, you've just been exposed to someone with the disease. The rules vary depending on what your vaccination status is. And from the CDC's point of view, it really only matters if you uh, are up to date. So if you've gotten your primary series and you've been boosted, if you're up to date with your vaccination, then you don't have to quarantine. You still have to monitor for symptoms, uh, but you don't have to stay at home from work or uh, you know, miss school or that kind of thing. So it, 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 that, that's one of the advantages of being up to date on your vaccinations and getting your booster is that you really don't have to quarantine uh, if you've been exposed to someone with COVID. The DESI language is a little bit different, I believe, and I'm not a, uh, uh, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think uh, the DESI language uses the term fully vaccinated. So if a teacher, let's say, has an exposure to uh, COVID and they've gotten two, sh two, two shots, their primary series, but not their booster, I think they do not have to quarantine. So is it it's safe? It's all a matter of risk management, right? So how much risk are, are folks uh, taking. So I believe that's my understanding of it. And uh, superintendent, correct me if I, if I got that wrong. Do we require staff and faculty be, to be boosted? No, we don't have, we don't have a vaccine mandate. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Anyone else with any questions? Any other members? Mr. Sullivan? <coughs> yes, Dr. Herman. Can you hear me? Wait, wait, just That's tough. I think the, uh, the, the sound breaks up unless I think you talk directly into the mic. Can you hear me now? I got you. <laughs> Dr. Herman, I just wanted an educated guess from you as a doctor. Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Is this COVID-19 ever going to be ended? I, I didn't quite get that. Was the question, do I see a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes. Yeah. It's, Is there yeah. an end to COVID-19 coming? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I remember back to, to, the, to the summer of 2020 when uh, somebody asked me sort of a similar question. And I said, listen, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be doing this into the spring of 2022. Uh, and now I'm not even quite so optimistic about that. I think uh, the answer is there will be a light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel is going to keep going. You know, I, I think it's pretty clear right now that COVID is here to stay. It's not going to go away. We are going to have to learn to live with it. We will become more adapted to it. You know, more of us will be infected. More of us will be vaccinated. The virus will change again and again and again, and uh, it will, we'll have to learn to live with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, most pandemics do, you know, burn themselves out after a couple of years. Uh, and hopefully that's what will happen with COVID as well. But we will have to figure out how often we're going to get vaccinated, what kinds of vaccines are going to be developed, uh, and, uh, you know, and who is going to be perpetually at risk and who uh, is not. 
and, and so uh, it, it's hard for me to imagine that there's going to be another spike like there was uh, uh, over the, you know, or like we're experiencing, I should say, right now. But uh, you know, the, the, the best guess I can offer is, you know, that hopefully, you know, the, 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 the bright the outlook would be, hopefully this Omicron variant has provided so many people with some element of immunity just because so many people have been infected that it will provide you know vast levels of immunity throughout the population to prevent some kind of horrible spike like this again uh, in the future thank you any other questions from any of the members i do have one last question um dr Harmon. so you just touched base on that the immunity so we have so many um so many people that have had the virus and and i'm one of them and how long can you wait to get the um the booster after having the covid um in your system i've heard right. you can go within i i know someone that just went after two weeks and i'm like i thought you had to wait 90 days uh, now, or 30 days no so you know so the the uh, the booster is five months after your uh primary series if you have covid you're advised to wait but you don't have to wait that long you really only have to wait uh, through your period of isolation, as long as your uh, symptoms have resolved. So the period of isolation, you know, is, let's say it's uh, 10 days. I know it's five days plus five additional days of masking. But if your symptoms have resolved and your 10 days of isolation is up, you can get your booster shot. Interesting. If you haven't gotten it yet. And, you know, the amount of immunity you get from COVID is nowhere near as much the amount of immunity you get from, a, from getting a immunization, getting the shot. Shot is, works better than having gotten the disease plus uh plus uh, you don't lose your taste and smell for weeks or, or, or months plus you don't run the risk of being on a ventilator and dying so yeah you know get your booster get a shot okay and i believe we just have uh, a question from mrs ehlers i just have one more question sorry what is long covid and is it are you still contagious with it like what exactly does long covid mean well, we're still learning about it. We, what long COVID refers to is people that have symptoms long beyond their period of infectivity. So people who have persistent symptoms after the disease has left them. So uh, persistent fatigue, uh, permanent, not permanent, long-standing loss of taste and smell, uh, uh, weakness or neurologic symptoms. Uh, and these symptoms can go on for months and months and Obviously, because the disease is only two years old, we don't know that much about it, so still learning about it. But no, you're not contagious when you have long COVID. Uh, you're just living with the complications of a disease that now has become chronic in nature. Thank you. Any other questions this evening? Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Herman, for always educating us and, and keeping us informed. Um, I guess that's, that's pretty much the key here is ed constantly educating ourselves about this disease. This is constantly changing, constantly, uh, from your quarantine time to you name it. There's always something new that we're learning every few weeks. So we do appreciate you um, keeping us updated. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Um, I also just added to COVID, I want to um, give a shout out to Aldo Petronio, our yes. CFO, who uh, was in the hospital for several days with COVID. Uh, he is now returned home last night, and he'll be, you know, resting at home, and he's still got some recovery time. But we wish him well, and happy to know that he's home now and recovering. So definitely, um, we're all happy to, to have him home now. Absolutely, um, definitely happy to have Aldo. Aldo, budget season's coming up. We need you. So uh, <laughs> we were definitely, you know, you got to rest up. But hopefully, he's watching us. But we've it, it was it was it's always a tough one when it's people that we know right. directly know and seeing our family and our friends suffering with the virus. So, but thank you. Thank you. So Tracy, we ready to queue up my PowerPoint? The, the clicker's there. Yep. Here, clicker working. Got it. All right, so I wanted to give you um, my mid-year report uh, to the school committee. 
Uh, and this is based off of our work uh, around the district review um, that came out um, the summer before last, so um, in 2019. So are we ready to, let's see, oh yeah, it's working. So I wanna give you my objectives, so following in line with what we're obviously asking teachers to do in the classroom, and I will. Um, we're gonna review key recommendations from the district review, uh, highlight what has already been implemented in each section of the district review, so we'll go through each section and, and I'll go over what's been implemented, uh, and then identify what still needs to be done. So just some background. Um, on uh, the purpose of a district review is establishing or strengthening a cycle of a continuous improvement. So that's what the um, DESE is looking to do when they come in and do these reviews. They spend a week. Uh, they always hire an outside consultants to do them. They do not do them with uh, inside DESE personnel. Um, and they focus on districts whose students achieve at low levels, either in absolute terms or relative to districts that educate similar populations. So uh, every District goes through a district review, um, but they also, but they do focus on districts where their students are performing at low levels. So um, a couple of um, quotes that were in uh, the district review that stick with me uh, and with all of us since uh, this was, since its uh, previous heights, height as nearly a decade ago as recognized leader in closing the achievement gap, Brockton has experienced a continued decline in academic outcomes and there's little sense of urgency or awareness in the district about the continued decline in student achievement. So again, some of these things that they, they said hit, really hit home. Um, so there was a district review back in 2013. Um, since then, we continued to decline achievement. There was little evidence that the district acted upon the recommendations of the 2014 district review. This one, uh, we did, do, there was pushback because again, in 2000, when it came out in 2013, that's when the money really started to dry up. So a lot of things that could have been done, we weren't able to do, structures were torn apart. However, um, there are some things we could have done and, um, and they hit us on that. So again, so some things we can excuse, others we can't. I was a deputy superintendent during this time. So again, a lot of this responsibility fell on me as well. So. Um, but we got to look back and see what we can do better. Um, so now it's no longer the case. We have to act on these things. So we have now have that DESE partnership. We have an MOU with DESE uh, that lays out a clear improvement plan. Uh, it's a sign between me and Commissioner Riley. So that's how serious we were about moving forward. It was the first of its kind with the Department of Education. No other district has a signed agreement with DESE. Um, and since DESE helps figure out funding, um, it was strategically done to enter into a, an agreement with them. I contacted Commissioner Riley um, pretty much a week after I had time to digest the district review and said, listen, we need a partnership. So DESE needs to play a role in ownership of this. And they have, right now, they have supported us with resources. They have supported us with people. Um, and they continue to do that as we, we look at all our structures. Um, so we're taking a focus action on every section of the district review, so we're gonna go through that. Uh, all right, so what we had been doing wasn't, hadn't been effective, it was a seven years of decline. Again, a lot of that was structures that were ripped apart, um, a lack of effective instruction, uh, a lack of assessments uh, district-wide, especially at the secondary level. Um, and it wasn't about people not working hard. All of us in the executive team, uh, teachers, administrators, paras, MTAs, everybody picked up extra work because, again, we were laying people off. So it wasn't about people not working hard. Uh, everybody has done that and continues to do that. Um, but we had to, uh, to all to target our work to student outcomes. So we ought to obviously had to focus on our student outcomes and it all has to be about student achievement. So this is key points in the district review. And again, as you see their categories, first one is leadership and governance. Um, so this was what they said then. The district, the district has not established the culture of collective responsibility, collective responsibility for district and school improvement. There was little urgency or awareness about the continued de decline in student achievement, few focused discussions on how construction could be improved, and a tendency to blame external factors. 
Um, you know, they, you know, they watched a lot of, again, this was something that you'll hear um, Mr. Minicello at the time, Mr. D'Agostino, you that were here, you know, and a lot of it did hurt because we cut over $68 million of funding in an eight-year time, and that really beat the district, and it beat us up bad. However, parents don't want to hear that. They want to hear what we're doing for their kids and how are we educating them and how are we moving forward. That's what parents, that's what taxpayers want to hear is that I know they cut your budget, but what can we do now to make sure you, we're doing the best for kids? Um, and again, they said again about the district review that we didn't do enough at the time um, from the 2014 report. Uh, leadership and governance, some th key points. Um, this was something that they, they really recognized in Brockton, that uh, the culture of Brockton is one of congeniality um, in which staff members care about students. And they said that about the school committee as well, um, about students but have not created a culture of engagement and reflection that includes reviewing data objectively and considering their personal and collective responsibilities for student success. District leaders have lowered expectations for themselves and students have not recognized their power to improve all students' performances, opportunities, and outcomes. So again, something that hit home with me as I was, again, the deputy superintendent, uh, with our leaders, our principals, um, to really look at ourselves and see what we were doing to make sure we improved uh, student achievement. Again, people work well together. They care about each other. We care about kids, but it was about uh, doing some different things to see better outcomes. Um, and then this was one that we continue to bring up with our leaders is that Brockton had become a district of schools rather than a school district. So what we have put in place um, since this came out and since our partnership with DESE, we hired key administrative positions that were not in place before. And again, this was part of the budget cuts a deputy superintendent, an executive director of um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, executive director 6 to 12, a director of hiring, evaluation, and supervision. There is going to be a position of director of PD, and we added back the associate principal of Brockton High School. Again, those positions, the deputy superintendent, we didn't, I didn't replace myself for two years. Um, the director of PD, uh, we didn't have. Evaluation person, we didn't have. The associate principal, which we cut f almost five years ago now, um, and the district view actually called out for that position, how poor it was to cut it. So, um, so those positions are now back. And then we developed our three focus areas, effective instruction, active reading and writing, and then positive relationships. Um, there's been a focus on data, meetings at every school led by Dr. Cancel and Maria Lafort to make sure that our leaders are focusing on data and how to then um, work with our educators, how to review that data and how it drives instruction. Um, our school improvement and turnaround players are all aligned now with the focus areas. Um, September 23rd, we had a district in-service for all teachers to discuss the district review and we focused on instruction uh, January 20th is a district in service on implementing the district wide active reading and writing strategies, and they're going to target MCAS in essential skills. So that's coming up this Thursday, so that's district wide, so we're all on the same page. Um, still, that we need, I need to work on, and the district needs to work on, we have our strategic plan, and I'll have Laurie Likas come probably to our next meeting to update our new school committee members and to give an update on uh, the school con con committee members that have heard her before on our uh, update on our strategic plan, our new strategic plan. Uh, we'll be voting on that right around March 1st, and that's obviously the blueprint for the district, uh, which is very clear and concise, and so parents can see that strategic plan and see what the district uh, should be working on over the next six years. Um, so it'll be done in the spring. It's been a long process. It's been delayed a bit to a COVID, but Larry Likas in the planning success for success model for strategic planning has been very inclusive. Um, it's been very telling. We've done a lot of work around it, and a lot of people have been involved, not only um, school personnel, parents, our community partners have worked with this as well, uh, and she has done a great job putting it together. 
We'll have a new organizational chart, which is in progress, and I'll be presenting that to the school committee soon. Uh, we'll be reviewing data now for when we make staffing decisions and come to you. Uh, when the budget comes out at the end of this month from the governor, we'll be working on that number. We'll be coming to you, and we have to base those decisions based on data. That's something else the district review really pointed towards, that we need to make decisions based on our strategic plan, based on what's best for kids. Um, so we'll be coming to you with some staff, you know, the, the budget around staffing decisions, and that, again, is in progress and will be in progress for the sp most of the spring. Uh, we got to continue to focus on decision making around student outcomes, and this is obviously ongoing. So the decisions that we have to make as a leadership team, as a school committee, has to all be focused on the outcomes of students um, as far as academic and what's best for them social, emotionally, and again, all the extracurricular and programs that we do with kids that are enrichment that really help them do well in school. Uh, we'll have our school committee retreat that we always have in March. Um, we usually have that for four hours on a Saturday. Uh, we will start to put that together, and I'll be reaching out to you and through uh, Vice Chair Azak to come up with um, the agenda items you'd like to see on it. But obviously, that's something that will come up, and we'll have that in March. We'll have to work together to pick out a Saturday. Um, next, the next area is curriculum and instruction, and these are the key points. Um, and this was one of the quotes from there. Instructional improvement in the district is elusive observed instruction district-wide that shows, showed inconsistency in low ratings within across school levels in terms of implementing an instructional model that reflects evidence-based best practices. So what we have put in place so far, and again, this is um, a credit to work that was done um, and was done with very little resources. The Office of Teaching and Learning spent a lot of time on really researching and focusing on trying to find high quality curriculum materials in pre-K. Uh, they've done that with math, um, middle school with ELA and social studies and, and math and science. So those things have been put in place thanks to your support on that, but the Office of Teaching and Learning did a ton of work piloting curriculum to make sure we were picking the, the, you know, the best curriculum out there. They went through the curate process through DESE and um, you know, we really are starting to get ahead of the game with our curriculum materials. Um, we need to do continued PD around using those instructional materials. There's a lot of PD that's going into math um, at the pre-K to five. Um, that new math program is, you know, we're putting that in and there's a lot, of more, lot more PD to do around that. Um, the continued development of the focused areas. Principals using f uh, faculty meetings for PD around the focus area. So faculty meetings are not about announcements, about fire drills and things like that. Those can be done in emails. This is about uh, using the time with educators that we need that's important time to focus on PD and again to focus on our focus areas. We've re returned to make sure that there's uh, obviously teachers are doing lesson plans. So there's a common lesson plan template that was de developed this past summer. Uh, we've been conducting walkthroughs using a common walkthrough tool and protocol. Um, I've been part of several of those. Uh, walkthrough, the debriefing at the end of it uh, is really critical, sitting down with the, um, the principal and the people that are involved in the walkthrough and going through what we, what we saw in classrooms. And then we follow up with a written summary. So uh, Maria Lafort's been leading that work with us, and uh, again, it's been very effective. Again, we return to writing lesson objectives using student-friendly language. Um, so students know every class that they go into, uh, what they're expected to learn and what the outcomes are and what they're doing for the day. Um, then we're, you know, we've developed a district protocol for looking at student work. And then we have established a virtual school, which is one of only four districts across the state that did that. Um, it wasn't easy, it's still not easy, I wanna thank Christina Gallant, Dr. Connors, um, Sharon Wolder has done a lot with that as well. Uh, Principal Burns, before she went to Brockton High School, was spending a lot of time uh, with our virtual learning school, but has given 400 students, and we had to cut off the registration because we would have had probably 1,500, but 400 students the option for a virtual school, which, um, again, uh, we've worked out kinks, but there's still a lot of work to do, but 
it has worked well for students and parents that chose that option, and we'll have to look until next year whether we expand enrollment into the virtual school. Um, so here's our focus series again and what these look like. Focus on effective instruction, number one. Focus on active reading and writing. And then obviously the focus on positive relationships. Oh. So um, these are the instructional initiatives. We had, again, the lesson plan template in the walkthrough tool that um, were developed last summer, presented to um, principals and leaders um, in the spring, I mean in the, in the fall, and then rolled out with teachers obviously across the district. So again, the lesson plan template and the walkthrough tool. Um, and then our more on initiatives, standards-based grade level learning goals, written and student, these are the objectives that teachers need to have on the board. And when we go in to do uh, observations in classrooms, not only formal observations, but in our walkthroughs, this is what we need to see. A standards-based grade level learning goal is written in student-friendly language, explained to students so they understand what they are learning, how they will learn it, and how they will know they know it. So um, it's essentially what they will know and be able to do during that class. Uh, so they're written, students will be able to, or students will understand, or I can, those kind of statements are what we should see in objectives. Um, and Sue pre presented this before, and it's worth going over again, is why we're doing this. Um, it's the learning target, and it's hard, to hit, it's hard to hit a target if you can't see it. So if students don't know what they're supposed to be learning in the classroom, it's going to be very difficult to them to learn it. So uh, a meta-analysis of 53 research study, Mazzano, found that when students were clear and advanced about what they were learning, their achievement was on average 34 percentile points higher on tests used in these studies and students in, in the control group. So basically, when students knew what they were, the objectives were clear, the teacher was clear what they were there to learn that day, you can see the difference it makes for kids. Um, goals to be accomplished, uh, curriculum materials, we need a new pre-K to five ELA program that's aligned to the standards. Uh, we have a grant into DESE who highly recommended that we applied for it. Uh, we should know about that grant within the next few weeks. Uh, that will help us pilot and select a new curriculum for pre-K to five e an ELA program. That's in progress. Uh, we hope that we get um, they want us to do it this year, so we're hoping sooner or later we'll find out about that. Um, continue to provide district-wide PD on, on, PD on effective instruction, uh, most importantly around increased rigor, student engagement, accelerated learning, and scaffolding to ensure that all students are receiving standard grade-level work, standards-based grade-level work. This is on goal, ongoing. We're focusing a lot. We will be focusing a lot on scaffolding. We've um, had several meetings with the Department of Education. We're in the Accelerated Learning Network. So as you know, DESE is not calling, bringing kids back up to speed because of the COVID uh, slide. They're not calling that remediation. You can't do it through remediation. You need to do it through acceleration. And a big part of that is scaffolding and how it teaches scaffolding their lessons. Um, these are still goals that need to be accomplished, development of an early college program. This is huge. We just submitted our early college application. Um, I was in Assumption College. Uh, well, I'll tell you more about that story later. But um, So we uh, submitted an application for early college for all high school students, not just Brockton High. It's all high school students that are in our pathways as well because uh, it's about equity. Um, in grades 9 to 12, we want to do whatever we can to make sure our students can graduate high school with an associate's degree. And we've applied for the DESE grant. Um, we're working with several colleges partners, and we should know within the next month how that goes. Um, but again, this is one of the, that's, this is in our Student Opportunity Act plan. It's in our ESSER plan. So early college is, is going to be really good, and it's going to be big for our kids. Consistency amongst our middle schools, and this is something that um, Mr. Minicello, I know he's not watching tonight, but this is something he's pushed for for years, uh, and rightfully so, is um, there's too many inconsistencies in our schedules uh, in a curriculum that need to be addressed. 
Uh, we're doing that with a task force as we move into the spring to make sure all middle schools are basically on the same page, using the same language. So if a student does move from the south side to the east side, they're not going to see a huge difference. If they go from Asheville to north, there's not going to be that huge difference that we see now. And again, that's something Mr. Minicello talked about for his, what, 16 years on the committee, and uh, we have not made much progress there. Um, and some of it is basically we need to really be clear with our leaders that this is going to change because we've tried it before um, and there was a lot of pushback at the school level and we're going to have to fight through that because it's what's best with, for kids, not what's convenient for adults. So we have to continue to make sure we remind people of that. Um, we got to have equitable access for all students for a range of rigorous learning opportunities. That's in progress. Uh, this is the middle school task force. Again, it's all about equity. Um, we have a talented and gifted committee in progress that's working on how we get more students of color, more students that with disabilities, and more English language learners into higher level classes, into AP, uh, and making sure we're supporting them when they get into those classes. Um, so we have a committee that's working on that now. Uh, and also, we got to continue to review and provide additional support for the virtual school. Assessment, uh, key points here. This is the third section that the district looks at. The district has established a useful database. However, the district has not established a district-wide culture of shared responsibility for using common assessments aligned with state standards to guide teaching and learning. Common assessments are uh, an issue for us, uh, especially at the 9 to 12. Um, Pre-K to five and, and six and eight have done a pretty good job, especially at the elementary level, of having common assessments. It, we haven't done a good job with this at the secondary level. Uh, we need to come a long way in that. And um, as you know, Dr. Cancel does a great job um, with presenting data, collecting data, making it easy for people to understand, but we have to do a better job using it. So this is what we've put in place. There's data meetings held with every principal, with Dr. Cancel and Mrs. Lafort, to review school data to inform instructional practice. Again, data is what's supposed to drive your instructional practice, and that's what leads to student achievement. Um, we have regular formative, regular formative assessments. For example, we have STAR. Again, elementary, it's strong. Uh, to track student progress, we have we targeted uh, MCAS preparation beginning February 2nd, every Wednesday. It will be a district-wide initiative on active reading and writing, use, using multiple selections and grade-level math activities. Our January 20th in-service will provide this training to teachers across the entire district. It's a deliberate practice on focus area number two in action. Uh, still things we need to accomplish. We need to review our current assessment practices to focus on the target, on to target and form an instruction. Again, in progress, we'll be completing this by the spring. Again, we need to make sure that we're using our assessments to focus on what we need to improve and to inform our instruction. Um, development of a district assessment calendar for coordination of all assessments and to inform instruction. Uh, so we need a district-wide calendar that lays out all of our assessments and parents understand what the assessments are and what uh, we're measuring students and how do we use those assessments to drive instruction. Again, that's in progress and we completed this spring. Um, continue systematic collection and review of student work. This is ongoing. Obviously, this is a big piece. It's not all about tests and looking at results from tests. It's looking at student work in the work the students are doing every day uh, for their teachers. Uh, and then develop a common assessments at Brockton High School and also our other pathways. Um, this is in progress and will be completed by the end of the year. This is something we have not done a good job of um, that we have to make sure is in place by the end of this year, um, is having common assessments at Brockton High School in our other, um, our other key center, the Huntington, and our other pathways as well. Um, area four, human resources and professional development, some key points. Um, 
the district has not taken full advantage of evidence-based practice to uh, evaluate the level of instructions. Principals did not receive documented performance evaluations over the two years before the on-site review and have not been held accountable for improvements in their schools. Furthermore, principals' evaluations of teachers showed limited high-quality feedback to bring about the change needed to improve teaching and learning. So basically, we weren't doing a good job evaluating principals, and in return, the principals weren't doing a good job evaluating teachers. So um, that was something they really hit us hard on. That's something they're watching very closely to make sure everyone gets evaluated. Um, and it's, it's just, it can't go undone. Everyone this year that's supposed to be evaluated will be evaluated. Um, so these are the things we have put in place. Um, we have recruit, recruitment of a, diver, a diverse cadre of teachers and support staff. This is something that obviously was a goal of mine and a goal of yours is to really improve um, hiring teachers and support staff of color. We've made huge, prog a huge progress in that area. Um, we hired key leadership positions, as noted in the district review. Uh, um, in, the, in HR, we have a new director of hiring, evaluation, and supervision. That's a huge position, especially, and it focuses mostly on evaluation right now. We have an evaluation system in place for all principals be eva being evaluated by me or the deputy superintendent. Everyone is provided, every leader has their evaluation list. It's clear and who they're supposed to evaluate. Again, some of this has fallen off because we had leaders picking up two, three, four extra jobs when people were laid off, and then a lot of it got lost, but there was no excuse why not to evaluate principals, and that can't happen again. Um, we have principals. We did a district-wide. We had um, an afternoon where all principals were trained in evaluation strategies and feedback, actually the executive team as well. Um, we had a... Um, at a Val PD workshop that is currently being run by a director of um, hiring and evaluation. Uh, she actually has one tomorrow. Um, all meetings for principals and faculty are being used for professional development around our focus areas to improve instruction and clear process for administ administrative interviews to ensure that there's equity when we're interviewing for administrative positions. Um, goals to be accomplished. Um, as you know, we have many teachers who are uh, paraprofessionals and MTAs who are hired on emergency licenses. Uh, that has been extended for another year by the commissioner and the Board of Education. Uh, we need to do whatever we can to help them to get fully licensed. A lot of these are our own people that have worked in the district. A lot of them are Brockton residents. A lot of them are people of color. We need to do what we, uh, everything we can do to help them get certified and get through that emergency license and get their, uh, their regular certification. So I know Human Resources is working on that, but across the district, we're working on that as well. Uh, we need to retain our new educators. I want a shout out to the EDI office, has organized affinity groups to provide support, and that's in progress and it's continue and ongoing. And that's important, it's not about just hiring teachers of color, it's retainment, because uh, studies show that, you know, you know, if you can do a good job hiring, it's retaining teachers of color to make sure that they're in an environment that's comfortable and they're able to thrive. Um, more district-wide PD to address improving improve in instruction. Um, we need to get a PD position in place to revive the process of designing and implementing PD across the district so it supports our focus areas. And again, it's all about improving instruction. Um, five is student support. Um, the district serves a large, diverse urban population. 73.4% of students were high needs compared to 48.7% statewide. High needs is economically disadvantaged students with disabilities and English language learners. The review showed that more effective academic support systems were still needed, especially for our ELs and students with disabilities, particularly related to, our, uh, to their instruction in general education settings. So when we you know, the inclusion settings for our ELs and our uh, students with disabilities. We have to make sure that it's all about equity, again, to make sure that these students are getting what they need to be successful um, and move, again, get them inclusion, put them in uh, as many, you know, inclusion opportunities as possible. That's all about equity. Uh, what we have put in place so far since the district review 
I ordered an external assessment of the uh, special education department. Uh, it resulted in a redesign of the structure. Um, more support now is in schools with the special ed um, department. They have a special ed team. Before this structure was changed, we had some department heads that were working with eight different principals uh, and some team chairs as well. Uh, now it's really pared down, so the department heads are working with very few principals, so it's much better communication, and obviously that's going to, um, in return, have much better outcomes for students, and we can uh, make sure that everything in their IEPs is being implemented. Um, we have additions of an EI coach, um, which is um, very important for our special education students. We have transition specialists. We have MSN teachers we have added. We've added vocational teachers to the Huntington School. We've added tier two behaviorists, and we have more support staff around for students with disabilities. In bilingual, um, we are now conduct, they're conducting, a, uh, and I added, we had a meeting this afternoon. They're conducting a self-assessment with, the, with their blueprint project. This is driven by DESE. Um, we hired additional ESL teachers. Uh, we hired an additional department head. Actually, we hired two additional department heads. Um, and then bilingual staff, obviously, in, uh, needs to be included in all our professional development. So we're looking at bilingual education. We're looking for a redesign to make sure that um, students are not spending too much time in bilingual classes to make sure they're out, making sure they're getting opportunities to thrive, get into higher level classes. Uh, again, it's all around equity. So hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have a good plan in place for um, a structure around uh, bilingual, but the bilingual department is, uh, and I had a meeting today with DESE, with, um, Another consultant group that works with DESE is spending a lot of time looking at their own practices, their own structure, and they'll be, we'll be coming up with a, a plan to bring it before you probably sometime in late April. Um, this, this is uh, what we put in place. It's around inequity. We obviously have our new Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion that ha was ex established last summer. Um, we had our first annual district-wide ACT conference held on November 2nd, which was uh, election day, our first ever full day of PD. It was um, ach achieving change together, and Renee and her team did a great job putting that together. Um, we continue our training on our EDI checklist that was developed with Sharon Wolder and her team a few years ago, um, and it's been a focus of uh, the EDI office's work. Um, we're focusing on academic acceleration for talent and gifted at all levels. Um, again, the early college due enrollment position, we have somebody that's now working hired in that position to actually look at how we're going to get involved in having several colleges as partners, not just, not just state colleges, but private colleges as well. And then in school climate, um, PBIS training added to middle schools in the champion. Uh, and I know uh, Principal Burns is bringing that to Brockton High School. It's done. It started in, and has been in the, in the elementary schools for years, uh, and they've done a great job with it. Um, and it's gone into middle schools, and now we need to bring it to the secondary level. Uh, we did hire a, uh, Brockton High School as assistant principal of culture and climate was added uh, earlier this year. Uh, we've added behavior and interventionists. We are starting and need to pick up on this uh, at a faster rate is restorative justice training. We've added additional SACs at every level. Um, we have a re-engagement office um, that has been uh, strengthened, and these st students have dropped out to re-engage them. Um, and we have mentoring for them and to provide the support to get kids back into school. We've added several mentors across the district, um, and they're through, and they're working with um, uh, Lisa Rodriguez out of the EDI office uh, for the student support. Uh, she's oversees the mentors to make sure, again, that we're, um, it's all about equity and making sure kids are getting what they need. Goals, still things to be accomplished. More PD needed on culturally responsive teaching. We're in the beginning stages. Um, and again, and, and Renee and her team are leading this. More PD and integration of PBIS throughout the entire school. 
all levels. Again, it's been done very well at the elementary. It's moved into the middle schools. Now we need to take it in grades 9 to 12. It's ongoing and in process. More work on inclusion for students with disabilities at all levels and redesign of a bilingual model to ensure equity and inclusion for all students. That's in process and we'll be coming to you that soon. As you know, in bilingual, we, we still bus kids across the city out of their neighborhood school because they have the SEI strand is like, we have kids on the south side that get bused to the Brookfield. So they get taken out of the neighborhood school. Um, they go to the Brookfield because that's where the strand is and then if, they, if then they get out of the bilingual program, they leave the school, go back, and it could be in the fourth or fifth grade. Um, it's not a good model right now. Uh, it's not equitable, and it's not fair to students not to be in their neighborhood school. So uh, that's what a lot of the rede redesign is around that, um, is to try to keep kids in their neighborhood schools. However, they still need the support to be successful as English language learners. So, we're coming up in a ways to keep them in their neighbor a way to keep them in their neighborhood school but also give them the support they need to be successful um again more work on inclusion for our students with disabilities that's at all levels i already went over that and again i just talked about bilingual financial uh and asset management number six uh, the district has a well-developed maintenance and capital planning process and cooperation between the district and the city and it's new, may new mayor, they said it's harmonious, so you know, we'll see. I mean, it's been working well, and it continues to with the capital improvements. As you know, we just bought the May Center, so that's been, it has been harmonious with that. Um, district should develop a clear, comprehensive budget document that clearly details how the budget is aligned with district and school goals. So this year, you'll see a difference in the budget documents, so they're more user-friendly, how they align with our focus areas, how they align with the goals of the district, your goals as well, how they're going to align with our new strategic plan. Uh, that's something that they said that our budget documents need to be more clear, and so they're more user-friendly for not only us, but also for uh, our stakeholders. So these, what we have put in place so far, and again, this was done a few years ago, the six-year capital plan created based on municipal and school facilities. That master plan is still in place. That actually, um, that really helped us when we put in our SOI for Brockton High School. We should know about Brockton High School on March 3rd. The MSBA board meets. Uh, and that will let us know whether they welcome Brockton High School into the core program, which is a, a renovation or a complete uh, brand new high school. So if we get accepted into that, we'll have to enter into the feasibility study, and then it's a long process. I mean, if we get accepted, it's probably about six years away before they actually swing the first hammer. But if we get in, that's, that's going to be big for us because we get 80% reimbursement from the state for any new school or renovation. So um, we've done numerous renovation projects at many of the schools. We upgraded systems. We'll continue to upgrade. We've done several new roofs, uh, heating system. We've upgraded electrical uh, grounds. We continue to do that. Um, we have to shift in priorities for uh, COVID response. So obviously we had to make sure we got into the deep cleaning, buying several of the spray guns to deep clean, um, PPE. Uh, obviously you know how much we spent in technology to make sure every student got a one-to-one -one device. And then we phased out our old laptops and brought in new ones. So we've made a huge a jump with that. But it also included a lot of work in the schools to do a lot of electrical work so we could charge those. Um, this was a fun one. We established and launched a new bus company during the whole thing, COVID. So people forget that the... Um, you know, how much work that was to um, um, launch a new bus company. So I want to thank Dr. Cobbs and his team and Aldo for the work they put in uh, to establish this bus company. We're moving forward to buy the rest of the buses. Uh, so we'll be self fully self-sufficient next year. Um, and they've done a great job. And then, again, I want to thank the city and you for supporting this. And as you know, they're taking the key center um, for their new public safety building, and it was very important for us to s find a really good upgrade, a suitable home for our key center students who need it. 
um, in the May Center on Summer Street. I think it's 564. Is that the? What is it? 596 Summer Street. Um, that's our new location. Huge upgrade from the key. And again, the key school, uh, the old Brockton High, beautiful old building, but not conducive for modern day education anymore. So the May Center, it's a great location. Um, it's got green space, it's got a gym, plenty of parking, students are gonna get transportation. It, it's it's um, a huge upgrade for the students and staff of, of the Keith. So big shout out to Dr. Cobbs who actually found the building. He lives right there. And then uh, with the help of Mayor Sullivan and the facility subcommittee uh, team here, um, of the school committee to really push getting the May Center for the kids. It was all about making sure they got an upgrade um, and came true, which was a lot of work went into it, but um, we glad, we're glad it happened. So still things we need to do. Again, we need to uh, develop a budget document, details alignment to school systems and goals. That's coming this spring when you see the new budget. Um, we need to develop a plan to deal with spacious issues that might help. We're getting um, the bids coming back in for the modular classrooms that we're adding to some schools and upgrading to the other ones. Um, South is getting some modular classrooms. They don't have them. West is getting modular classrooms. They don't have them. Asheville is getting new ones. Brookfield's getting new ones. So they, we've got a lot of them coming in. We'll, and again, that bid should come in, uh, I think it's next week, Jim? Next week. Um, Review a security system, especially at Brockton High School. As you know, we're using the metal detectors, cameras, um, personnel to help with security. Uh, we are um, building office locations for the assistant deans. They're moving from the CAF to the second floor. Um, facilities will be building uh, those out, and they will be moving be over the next couple of months. Um, that's going to be big to get our assistant deans up on the second floor, more visibility. Um, and then obviously the renovation or replacement of Broughton High School, and we'll know again, on, I jumped ahead earlier, board, the board meeting is on my birthday, March 3rd, so let's hope we get good news that day. So again, the, the quotes from the district review, since the review in 2000 experience continued decline in achievement, little evidence the district acted upon those recommendations from the, from the report. Um, you know, it's not the case any longer. We've implemented a lot of the recommendations from 220 district review and have further, um, we have a lot to go going forward. Again, big difference now, we have a lot of money to spend, which is a big help between 2014 and 2020. Um, there can be no more excuses. Um, money cannot be the excuse anymore. Uh, it's all about kids, it's all about their achievement. Parents don't wanna hear excuses. They wanna hear that we're providing their, their their children with the best education possible. So some final reminders, this is the year about accountability. Accountability is not a personal attack. It's, it's all about student achievement. Again, this is not, anybody wasn't working hard. This is about, it's not personal, it's business. So we have to make, and our business is student achievement. What gets monitored is what gets done. Um, we haven't done that in a while, we have to make sure, and again, that goes back to the evaluation process, evaluating everyone, including our leaders. Uh, we have to show results this year. We can show results this year. Brockton kids, and we have to continue to say this, is that you know, our kids are as good as any kids anywhere. Our kids can do it. They can achieve at high levels. Uh, we can't make excuses for them. I know that some come from very tough backgrounds, but that you can't excuse you can't feel bad as far as you can be compassionate. You can make sure they get the supports they need, but not holding them accountable to perform in the classroom does not do those uh, kids any favors. Our, ki our kids can achieve, they will achieve, and it's about us doing the job to make sure they achieve. And again, this can't be us any longer that I'm sure that, I'm sure glad the hole isn't on our end of the boat, like that school is failing, but we're not, so it's, it's a district. We're a school district, not a district of schools, so I, I can take any questions. Anyone have any questions at the moment? Yes, Mr. Mr. Oh, Mr. Sullivan. Yes. I'm gonna step on your shawl. <laughs> is that what that is, a shawl? Yes, you can borrow it. <laughs> Go ahead. Mike, I was just, I was just wondering 
has Dusty set up a timeline that this has to be completed? No, it's actually my agreement as them is like a three-year process. So they obviously monitor. So it's basically started this past um, September and will go for three years. Um, and then the new strategic plan will be a six-year strategic plan. But again, changes need to be made. They need to see progress. So they monitor the progress. I meet with them um, every other week. I meet with uh, the DESE team to update, on, update them on their progress. They're involved with our, um, our turnaround schools, so they're here often. Um, so they monitor us pretty much every other week. Okay, thank you. And they'll give you an update as we move forward, forward to the new strategic plan. You'll probably see Desi again in April to give you an update on how things are going on from how they feel things are going from their end. Thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. Ehlers? <clears throat> So I have to be honest with you. I am a big proponent of if you can measure it, you can manage it. And so my question is, it's two part. One, do you feel like we have all the measurements and the metrics in place to really be able to identify student outcomes so that we can say whether we did a good or bad job? And then the other question I have is, all of this was rolled out in 2020 and we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're putting all of these things in place for, you know, for EDI and whatnot, but how's the morale of faculty and staff? I mean, we've put a lot on them. The transition of this whole plan, the pandemic, constant change. I guess what I'm interested in is do you feel like we're getting the response and the buy-in from your team at all levels that this plan is doable for us and that we can get there? Well, um, I, a lot of, you know, some, it's hard, again, it's being implemented during the pandemic, but a lot of things were done prior to the pandemic, like mm -hmm. a lot of the new curriculum that has been purchased and put in place at the elementary and at the middle school was pre-pandemic, so it's good that we're able to get a jump on that again, and that was helpful. Um, people are burnt out, they're stressed, um, yeah. but we're still accountable to parents to make sure we're giving the kids the best we can. There are going to, obviously there is a slide with COVID. You saw that in um, the MCAS scores when Ethan did his presentation. Um, it's, but it's more about the, we got to continue to do those, those assessments um, at the school level. Um, again, we've done a good job of that at the elementary, middle school, but not well at the secondary level. So we got to continue to do that. And it, I just think it's, it's it teachers are doing all they can with their support staff, um, doing their best in, 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 you know, when people, a lot of people out for COVID, it's been a struggle, but we have to, we have to do better for our kids. We really don't have a choice. I mean, it's, um, we can continue to say that the pandemic, again, it's beating everybody up, but at the end of the day, we have to continue to see what we can do to continue to approve to, for, you know, that's what parents expect of us. But it's not easy, but we have to keep working, pushing forward, moving forward, I as gotcha. somebody keep always swimming. tells me. <laughs> keep swimming. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Any other members with any questions or comments? I just have one comment. So thank you, Superintendent, for the presentation. Um, as, as a few of us have been here for quite a few years, so we were here when we had major budget cuts. And as you said, that's, we're not gonna use that as an excuse anymore. We have some funds, we're able to uh, work on, on the areas that we need work. And so, you know, the May Center, do we have a projected time on that yeah so we have the building uh the paper it, it's closed we're in there now um we're doing all new carpet some new flooring um we're doing we have painting coming in to do uh that we need to do some upgrades per the fire department um deputy chief um eddie williams was in there to make sure that it's up to code so there are some things we have to do um and you know there's some you know a f little minor construction like taking some walls down and, and making the cafeteria a little bit bigger. Our goal is to be in there by the end of February. If all goes well, we'd be in there by the end of February. Um, I don't want to rush going in there because I, I don't, I, obviously it's much easier doing work to a, most of the work's cosmetic. We also have to have our IT go in and set everything up. So Jim is working on that. Um, I don't want to rush in there. If it has to be the middle of March, it will be the middle of March because it's much easier to do work in an empty building. So when we move in, it's move in. And 
kids have that great new spot, all new painted, renovated, and it's move-in ready. I don't want to then move people in, staff and students, and then have to go back and do work while they're in the building. So uh, we should be hopefully shooting for the end of February. It's probably sometime in early March, probably is something that's uh, more reasonable. Okay, and we'll definitely be out of, you, honestly, there is no rush. Um, no, I don't have, think we have a little bit of time. Yeah, the so. city, I think, is planning on taking the Keith down sometime in the late, probably May or June. Okay, so yeah, so. we definitely have time in, yep. to be able to transition from one building to another. Um, just curious, and you know me, I love the history. Is there anything we can save that's like historical that's over at the Keith Center? Anything that we I know. <laughs> is there anything we can say? Uh, sorry, Dr. Cobb. A couple of bricks. <laughs> a couple of bricks. I don't. No, it's just something. I'm always curious if there's something <laughs> that we could always save before they demolish it and um, just use I it. Don't All, know, right. We'll all right, you know me and my we'll, history. Whatever's anything that's Eagles, worth in Dr. that Cox. building, we'll take. We'll strip it clean. We'll take anything with us that will be like the Grinch when they left. All right. I think they are planning on saving. Just something, just yeah, just to preserve some of the some of the history, right. and then um, and you had touched base on you know we, who would have ever thought we have our busing. So we we are making changes. We are definitely making changes. So it's going to be an exciting um, exciting plan that we we just been over. Right. Um, so we, we do thank you. We thank the executive team and, and everyone for, for the information. Um, we will touch base probably under new business and maybe tr try to get some dates for our retreat ahead of time so everyone can make sure they're available. If we plan, you know, definitely get some dates out there from now where we usually meet in March just so we can get, um, make sure everyone's schedule and their availability. But thank you. Sounds good. So. We're all set. Does anyone have any items to refer to subcommittee? So it's, it's, this is a little kind of premature because we haven't accepted our subcommittees yet? I have one when we get there. Okay. So um, we want to refer, um, we need to come up with an equity policy um, for our policy manual. So I want to ask that we, um, we have a subcommittee meeting soon. Um, with the, uh, the subcommittee on diversity, race, equity, inclusion, uh, for that committee to work closely with the Office of EDI to develop an equity policy. We do have some samples from across the state and from out of state, uh, but I think if that committee can work with um, Renee and her team um, and then present a draft policy to the policy subcommittee, manual subcommittee, and uh, that's how that would work, would go, you know, the EDI. Uh, office would work with the subcommittee, then they would draft an equity um, policy that we could bring then to the uh, policy manual subcommittee and then to the policy, so, right? Is that how it goes? <laughs> well, the steps there, but we're, yeah. we're bound to figure it out, get, get, it, get it done the right way. So um, I, I believe Mrs. Mendez is, is um, on the list as far as chairing the um, diversity, race, equity, and inclusion with Mr. Homer, Mr. So, Mark, yeah, once we Ehlers. once it's officially voted on, we can have uh, um, the chair of that committee work with Melinda to schedule the date. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, anything else? To you had mentioned something about a bid next week. Do we need to schedule that under new business a bid review meeting? Yeah, um, Melinda, we find anything out about bid review? We got to get it scheduled once it's a so once there's a um, once the committees are set up. Um, I'm sure Mike, Mike Bandis will work with um, the chair to get that set up hopefully soon because I know there's some bids that have to go ahead. Ms. Mrs. Sullivan has a question. Yes. I, I can't call on anybody. You have to. Mrs. Sullivan? Um, yes. Um, I know Mike Bandis does have um, a bid because we did have a meeting scheduled and then the committee's changed. So I, I know he does want to okay. get that done. So I want this. Committee, subcommittee. Yeah, we had a little bit of a delay. So yep. now, once we get the um, committees approved, which is um, under unfinished business, so if we're all set with um, any items to refer to subcommittee, we're going to just go on to the next item. Everybody good? Okay. So, under item number six, unfinished business, we have two items here discussion and potential vote on the two, 2022 subcommittee assignments. And then we have discussion and potential vote on the approval of rules and orders of the school committee. So under the um, subcommittee assignments, all the members have received their subcommittee assignments. If anyone has any questions or changes, I had. 
Everybody good with that? Okay, so we're going to get a motion. Motion to approve the 2022 subcommittee assignments. So, Mrs. Sullivan, but don't we need a roll? Do we need a roll call vote for that? No, we're good. Okay, so Mrs. Sullivan had made a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Mrs. Mendez seconded that. All in favor, please raise your hands. Accepted unanimously. Okay. And the next one is the discussion and potential vote on the approval of rules and orders of the school committee. Any questions on that? Mr. Rodriguez, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> motion to approve. Okay, Mr. Rodriguez made the motion to approve. Can I get a second? I'll second it. Mrs. Ehlers has seconded. If we can uh, just raise our hands, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Uh, let's see what we have here. Next item is new business, and under new business, we have um, discussion and potential vote on diversity, race, equity, and inclusion workshop training for school committee members. And Mrs. Mendez? Yeah, um, so Ms. Sullivan brought to my attention that on September 29, 2021, it was recommended um, in the diversity, race, equity, and inclusion subcommittee that the school committee take two workshops. And these two workshops are gonna be about three hours each. Um, this consent agenda was approved by the full committee on October 6, 2020. Um, at the beginning of last year of 2021, there was, um, there was one um, workshop that we were able to take when we, have, when we had Thomas Minicello and Mark Diagostino on board. But, at the, but because of COVID and just, you know, the agenda and things just happened during the year, we actually never got the second workshop. So at the beginning of this year, um, we had a discussion with Amina Manuel uh, about this, that we only did a three hour workshop. Therefore, it was advised that there would be another workshop as a refresher, just because we had two new committee members. So there would be the three hours that we just, we made up, which was this past Tuesday on January 11th, and then basically today, I am asking if we could do a part two of this workshop, but I would need a vote um, or a motion to approve an additional three hours so we can get the um, so we can get another workshop, another three hours for Tuesday, January twenty fifth. Okay. Any anyone with any questions, Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Uh, oh, so so Cynthia, it was six hours that we agreed to. So yeah, so that's what I'm asking today if um, because we have two new committee members now, if we can add an additional three hours and just to clarify to the public, this is the workshop is centering equity in policy and practices and on decision making. Um, but that's why I'm asking for the motion and to be um, if that is something that we want to vote for it today to accept an additional three hours. Okay, because I thought we, I thought the committee voted on a total of six hours, and we all voted on that. So if there was going to be any changes, then I think it was, should be brought before the committee, before there's changes. That's what I'm That's, doing right there's now. There's a motion on the table. Yeah. Like, well, she, we're, we're, we're That's going what to I'm have a motion right to add additional hours. Yeah. Because it wasn't discussed with the committee at all. Okay, none of it was discussed. Also, um, there was a total of six hours that we all agreed to. So. Well, if I can interrupt for a second, we had agreed on six hours, but in Mrs. Mendez's, um, she had mentioned, this was back almost last February. So it's almost a year later between COVID and, you know, scheduling and, and things like that. We weren't able to really get the full six hours and actually we had the additional three hours scheduled and then two of the committee members that are no longer on the committee were not able to attend so we needed the majority to attend i think it's a wonderful idea and i don't think six hours is enough we can always use training um if you have any other questions mrs sullivan or if it any has other nothing members? to do with with that it has to do with what we voted on okay and what was brought before the committee well, she's bringing nothing it before to do the with, committee right now, Mrs. Sullivan. It has nothing to do with that. The, it should get more than six hours. Yes, it's a very important topic. But I'm just saying 
we had agreed to six hours. So there was more added and we, we didn't discuss it. There wasn't- It wasn't brought before the committee. Well, Mrs. Mendez, I believe you're bringing it before the committee right now, correct? Yeah. So she that's is. what I'm asking. If um, a motion to approve for an additional three hours, and these three hours will be held on Tuesday, January 25th. But of course, that would be if the committee agrees to it. And I don't, I don't feel that because there's new members, okay, then we need, we shouldn't be repeating what the other members already, you know, got because a lot of that was a repeat on the last training of what we already saw the three hours. So I, I believe it's a very important topic. Can you speak into the mic, please? I can't hear you. I believe it's a very important topic and I believe that we should do more than six hours. But there was a lot of repeats on that training that we just had with what the other members already had. It's too important and there's too much material to repeat. So I think that we should take it you know, very seriously. Well, if we did repeat anything, we repeated the first three hours that we had last February, which was almost a year ago. So I know I walked away with a lot of information that I didn't walk away the first time. Um, I think we had an amazing, amazing workshop. So we've already done that. Are we going to see, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, do you have any questions? I think the clock is, uh, you know, this is a new committee. You know, we just got elected, we just got uh, sworn in. So I think we should just turn the clock back and do six hours or nine hours, whatever we see forth, and take that to a vote. I mean, I don't think nobody should be challenging this type of training. Well, I guess um, just to clear- I'm not challenging it. Uh, one moment. Mrs. Mendez and then Mrs. Ehlers, please. Oh, sorry. Um, just to clarify, um, so the idea of this, Ms. Sullivan, I understand your perspective of it feeling repetitive. Um, I think one huge part that we talk about and that is being taught in professional development throughout the district is the anti-racist spectrum is such a broad spectrum that, you know, one day you could be where you're like, yeah, social justice, let's do this. And another day you could be super biased and not really understand what's going on. So even though it may feel repetitive, I think the more you talk about it, the more you learn about it is the more that we can strive towards more equity, especially in what we do, which is in policies and decision making. Um, so that's my understanding. Um, and then it sounds like from my understanding what you're seeing it as, you're seeing it as basically just a training that you need to take and you need to check that box. In my perspective, especially as chair of DREI, I see it more. I see it what is our work and what our daily work should be to continue that achievement of students, which Mike said probably like keywords 30 million times in his presentation. Um, so I do see it more for the achievement of the students and that achievement of the students come with understanding what equity is and understanding ourselves and our biases so we can be better at the decision making. Mrs. Mendez, are you all set? Yeah. Mrs. Thanks. Ehlers and then Mrs. Sullivan. The only thing I would say is I understand where you're coming from, Ms. Sullivan, because you're basically saying that we agreed on six hours and we've already appeased the six hours between the training that happened last year and the one we just had last week. But the reality is, is can we all agree that the next three hours nobody has taken yet and has not been present for? And so for that, I would say, I think it's important for all of us to agree to the additional three hours, just because I think it's material none of us have seen or experienced yet. Is that fair? Like, like Thank I said. You. Mrs. Sullivan, one moment. Thank you, Mrs. Ehlers, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, Mrs. Sullivan, you have the, the floor at the moment. Uh, yes, like I said, um, Kathy and Cynthia, it's a very important topic, and I, you know, I really believe that we should have more than six hours. It was just, you know, as uh, Mrs. Ayler's pointed out, that we agreed on the six. So I was just pointing that out. We all want everybody to be transparent. So I agree to the three additional hours. I think it's very important. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to make a comment. So we, we've we've actually used our six hours that we've we voted on with previous committee members. So we just had the workshop. 
it was another three hours. So right now, are you requesting an additional three or maybe six? I don't think there's enough hours. I mean, I think it's wonderful. We can always use training, maybe shorter, maybe doing the other three, and then maybe another shorter one later on in the year. Um, you know, see what the committee members are interested in, in discussing as far as voting on additional hours. So for hours. today, I'm just asking for a motion to approve the additional three hours, and that would be on Tuesday, January 25th. And then if we want to add anything, that would be for further discuss discussion in the future. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay, so Mrs. Um, Mrs. Mendez, would you like to make the motion? Yes, motion to approve an additional three hours um, for the workshop on centering equity in policy practices and decision making, and this would be for Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. Okay, can I get a second on that motion? Mrs. Ehlers? Definitely second that. Okay, so Mrs. Ehlers, Mrs. Mendez made the motion, Mrs. Ehlers seconded the motion. All in favor, please raise your hands. And that um, is unanimous. Thank you. Great. Um, anything else under new business? Yeah, I just want to give an update on a couple of things. Sure. Um, uh, so um, last Friday, um, I was on my way to Worcester to Assumption College for a great meeting about early college. Uh, I received a call at about 1.30 from Principal Burns to let, inform me that a student at Brockton High School had been stabbed. Um, so obviously I turned around, came back to Brockton High School. Um, and I just want parents to know, this has been a very trying year, especially at Brockton High School. A gun, uh, a clip, uh, fighting, um, and now a student stabbed. And thank God it was non-life-threatening, um, but very disturbing, even though it was between two students. Um, you know, I went to Brockton High. I... Um, Grew up there as an edu uh, as a uh, leader for ten years, um, and I spent when we had a close Brockton High last week for two days because of lack of staff. I spent myself, several other central administrators went to the high school um, last week to support. Obviously, when we reopened the school Wednesday, um, Thursday, and then we had a snow day that Friday. But um, you know, it was you know it was actually the week before we did that and. Um, we spent a lot of time walking around, a lot, a lot of time stopping students without IDs, stopping students that weren't where they su were supposed to be. Because again, you have several classes uncovered because we cannot get substitutes, even though we raised the rate, uh, we still haven't been able to get subs. Um, so you have a situation where you have a lot of students who are wandering and unsupervised. We had... Um, Students were knocking on doors of classrooms where teachers are trying to teach, sometimes opening those doors. Um, something has to be done. Um, and I know that I put out something that's not very popular with a lot of people, but popular with others. I need to do something. I need to explain to parents how I can get more adults into the building to supervise the common areas, to supervise the doorways where kids are either leaving or could be letting other students in. Um, so we put this community ally position out. This is an at-will position. It's hourly. People don't get paid if they don't work. They have no union protection. Um, they uh, will expire on June 30th. They will, positions will not exist again unless we approve those. Any current Brockton Public School employee can apply, and they will get first preference to do this. They'll be trained in de-escalation and how to approach students, but this is about safety and security. They will not be teaching. They will not be asked to substitute. Um, they will be in hallways, they will be in cafeterias, and they'll be watching doors. Um, if I hire a security firm, it's about $60 an hour. Um, but again, any Brockton Public Schools current employee that wants to apply for this, they would have to resign their position, take this position. I think you earn one sick day a month. Uh, there's no vacation. There's no pay when there's no school. Um, and again, there's no union protection. And these positions will go away at the end of the year. Um, I have to do something to get more adults into the building. And again, I'm happy to have anybody that's a current Brockton Public School employee apply for this. Um, it just they need to know that this is not, this is temporary, a temporary solution. We have 4,000 kids in a building, and right now we don't have enough staff with COVID. 
So I'm open to other ideas, but I cannot go back and look at you and say, I'm not doing everything I can and look at the parents and say, I am not doing everything I can to protect students and staff at Brockton High School. Um, so there might be another solution. There might be something else. Somebody has a better idea. I'm open to ideas. You know me. Um, but I have to do something. I can't sit and say, okay, things are going fine and let's continue the way we're going because, you know, even though the, the, the staff at the high school, and again, 95% of the students at Brockton High School are great. I've walked around, I've met with them, I've met with a ton of them, they've told us, uh, Ms. Burns and I have met with several of them, they've been through a lot, um, there's been a lot of incidents, and I don't sit on my hands. We have to continue to do whatever we can to keep the school safe and so teachers can teach and we can have a safe environment. Um, you know, so again, I'm driving to Assumption College, I get a call from Principal Burns to tell me a student's been stabbed. I'm on my way to try to do whatever we can to get kids into an early college program, and then I gotta turn around and come back for that, and I absolutely, absolutely I would, but now I have to do something to fix it, so it doesn't happen again. Um, and with the lack of staff, and we can't get people, I mean, I have 60 open para and MTA jobs that we can't fill right now. I have several food service jobs we can't fill, fill right now. We have several positions, substitutes, they're non-existent. You cannot find substitutes. So if anybody else has any other ideas, I'm happy to take those, but I have to do something to get capable adults who pass a quarry and go through a training into the building to keep it safer than it is now. No, thank you. I know there was a lot of questions. Um, people saw the flyer, which is, I think is wonderful. We always have people that step up and want to want to step up and help out. This is a way to do it. But the key is they're going to get training. We're not just taking people off the streets. They're going to get proper training. They don't get the benefits. They they're not part of the unions. This is a temporary position. And I think there was just a lot of well, questions course. on that. And, and thank you for clarifying yeah, that. No one again. No one's been hired. All we're doing is accepting applications and. People have to be quarried, fingerprinted, and then they have to go through a full day's training for de-escalation. They have to, we have to look into their background, interview them to make sure they have any clue how to work with kids. Uh, again, I'm, I'm happy to take people that are current employees of the school system. It's just they have to know that this is a temporary position because um, they'll get preference because they work with kids. I'm happy to put them in them, these positions as well. Obviously, we have to backfill them. but. This, there's got to be de-escalation training. There's got to be training on how you approach students. What happens if they come back at you? Like, I mean, they came back at, at me when I stop them in the hallway and ask for their ID and ask them to take their hood off. And I'm the superintendent, and I've dealt with kids for 35 years. Um, and they tell me, you know what? You know, go take a flying leap. And, you know, you have to be able to know how to react to that and not escalate and get into confrontation. Um, it's basically, you know, it's how to deal with diff difficult situations. And I'm yeah. happy, again, to take current employees that already do this, um, but I have to do something to get more adults in the building. Given the number of students that we have, we need more adults in the buildings, and we need to be able to let our teachers teach. You just hit that right, right, on, the, right on the button. Our teachers need to be able to teach, and we, it's safety. We have to have safety. That's the biggest concern. None of us want to want to hear these stories. And you know, I just want to thank um, the superintendent, principal Principal Burns, our Brockton, um, our school police, and our Brockton PD. Because I I came by on Friday, and I came here to just you know see what's going on and to be another set of eyes and be here for extra support, um, and to show the students that you know we're here for you. We're trying and. So again, it's a situation none of us ever want to get that phone call and hear about what's going on. Um, but this is a step. I mean, we're always open for suggestions, any recommendations. We're trying. Yeah, we're so trying. like for an example, we just had two access control specialist jobs at the high school uh, open. Um, they make about $28 an hour, and I had, we had four applicants from inside the system. So, you know, um, I, again, it's, we need to do something to... I'm not, and again, you need to get people that 
can work with kids and know how to deal with kids, and when kids come back at you, know how to de-escalate and not escalate situations. So the training's important. Picking the right people is important. Uh, but I have to do something between now and June 30th to um, make sure the building is running efficiently, effectively, and supporting the administrators, supporting the teachers, because I don't want another call when I'm going to work on getting early college for our kids, which is so important for them, to turn around and deal with a, a poor kid that got stabbed. It, it can't happen. It's just, and I have to do something about it. It's just, we, it's unfortunate, and thank God he's okay. And the student that did it will, be, you know, was charged and will be dealt with to the full extent of our handbook. Um, but we have to do everything we can to put things in place so those things don't happen. You're never going to prevent any everything from happening. Things are going to happen. This it's a school, it's a large school. It has 60 exterior doors. Um, you got to do your best to keep it safe. But to help keep it safe is people. Adults that want to work with kids and be in the school and who better than people from the community that know how to work with kids that live in the community, um, have children that go to the school. So again, I'm happy to accept any current Brockton Public Schools employee into these positions. They'll get first preference, but something has to be done to get more adults in the building that care about kids. Okay, but those are temporary positions. Yep, be temporary, only, temporary. only until June 30th. Again, there's no pay when there's no school. Um, and there's no, again, when there's February break, April break, they won't be paid. Um, and there'll be no pay for, you know, there's just no, I mean, it's just, it's at, they're pretty much at will non-union employees. So if basically, if there's an issue with somebody um, and it doesn't work out, then the, I don't have to go through a process with the union to terminate them. And basically they will be asked to leave and they leave if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, any questions from the? I'm happy to take any, any questions. Any members just, have any if anybody questions? has any other suggestions, I'm happy to do whatever we can. I mean, I wanted to make sure we tried to recruit people from the community that you know want to be involved, want to work with kids. But again, I'll give first. We give first preference to our own first, and I'm happy to do that. But I just want people to understand this is not permanent. Uh, we can talk about if it becomes permanent, then obviously would have to become part of a, probably part, obviously part of a union, but um, going forward, it's just temporary to put some things in place because, you know, parents are afraid, students are afraid, and I need to keep everyone safe, and parents need to know that their kids are coming to a school that have enough adults and uh, is safe, and we're doing everything we can to make it that way and keep it that way. Thank you. Um, no questions from the, Mr. Sullivan? Yes, sir. <clears throat> one question. How many positions are there? I'd like to hire up to 20. So some will be full-time, some will be part-time, depending on people's schedules. Is that the high school only? Or right now, yes. Okay. That's our, our biggest concern. School, the other, again, you have 4,000 students. You have 350,000 square feet of floor space with over 65 exterior doors. Um, the other schools obviously are much easier to manage, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And there's, there's a lot of empty it takes space. People. It takes people, dedicated people, and again, I'm happy to any other suggestions, but I'd like to hire up to 20 people, and again, they'd have to go through a process of training. They'd have to go through the quarry, fingerprint, and interview process with a team of people. Um, that will make sure that we're selecting the right people, and if for some reason someone doesn't work out, then they would be asked to leave immediately. Okay. All right, so um, no other questions from the committee? Okay, um, I do have some other new business, the, the MLK breakfast on Saturday. Yes. Um, so we, yep, we were, we were able to um, attend F, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, Mrs. Mendez, uh, Superintendent Thomas um, and Mrs. Campbell, we were able to attend the MLK breakfast. And you know, the NAACP put on a wonderful presentation and a breakfast as they do every year. So we just wanted to um, thank them again for the presentation. And then. Um, and Renee gave a great keynote. Oh, we, yes. Renee Haywood, the Executive Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, did a great, gave a great keynote address. She was invited uh, by President Phyllis Ellis uh, to give the keynote, and she did a great job.
excellent speech. So it was, I was, it was great to be there. I apologize, Renee. I, t- I had to go to work, so I missed the speech, but I had to leave a little early. But thank you again. Um, so, so a little bit of fun. I like to have a little bit of fun. So I know we missed Mr. Sullivan's birthday early January. So happy belated birthday, Mrs. Sullivan. Mrs. Mendez, I believe your birthday is next week or is it this week? Next week. So happy early birthday. Um, and then if, for those that don't know me, this is my first meeting as vice chair conducting the meeting. So um, it is an honor to be here. Uh, it's an honor to hold this position. This little five-year-old girl that came here from another country is vice chair of the school committee. So I'm very proud. Thank you. I'm very, thank you. I'm very proud to represent my community. And as our superintendent, you know, English was not my first language. And I was, I was one of those students that was taking special classes because English was not my first language. So I just want to thank everybody. We had a wonderful meeting, very informative. I look forward to working together. We are a new team. We are here for each other, and we're going to work well together. And it's all about, there's no I in team. It's all of us. We're all one, one family right now. So, and we're here to work on behalf of our students and our families of Brockton and our BPS um, teachers and staff. We're here for everyone. So if anyone has anything else to say? No? Miss, oh, Mr. Rodriguez. Where's our student rep? Oh, we, do, we, we are working on that. Them. I think yeah, he's the, got the basketball. The one we had is in the middle of basketball, so we're getting another one. So, Miss Burns, I'm going to talk to her about getting our new one. But then he'll be back with us once the season's over. But we'll get the other one. So, Mr. Homer, may I get a motion to adjourn? Will I entertain a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. And can I get a second? Second. All right. I believe we're all we're all in favor of adjourning. Unanimous. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you so much.